I'd like to introduce myself because unfortunately Sister Janet Eisner was going to do this, but we are very um, sad that she's not with us this afternoon due to a, a bronchial infection. The doctor's orders, she's uh, going to lay low, and she would very much like to have been here to welcome each and every one of you to Emmanuel's campus for the special event. And she most especially is um, sending her fondest regards to Reverend Walker, with whom she's worked in the past and for whom she has tremendous respect. So um, my name is Mary McCauley Manzi, and I'm a proud member of the class of 1971. And, uh, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to um, make the introduction of our very special speaker this afternoon. Is everyone able to hear me? It's always a foolish question, that, since if you can't. <laughs> That's probably my only joke. Okay. <laughs> Reverend Walker, Dean Leonard, fellow alumni, future alumni, family and friends, and how you all overlap as you may. Thank you for joining us today for the lecture series which honors Dorothy Day, a courageous 20th century woman of faith whose life was dedicated to the pursuit of social and economic justice for all, or others really, but for all. This lecture series has been generously endowed by the members of the class of 1971 in acknowledgement of the friendships, scholarship, and fortitude each of us gained at Emmanuel, all of which informed us to each, each of us to make the choice in life, to life choices to achieve real social justice for others in many, many realms, both professionally and personally. <laughs> many have labored in the pursuit of our goals. Thank the good work of the alumni office here at Emanuel, and we send special thanks to Kay Morty O'Dwyer, formerly of the alumni office, <coughs> Kay's work was critical to the establishment and the development of the series. For four years, she was relentless in her efforts to ensure the success of this endeavor. We have lost her grace and her wisdom to the Boston Ballet Development Office. And we remain always in her debt, as it's our belief that the series would never have come to fruition without her. Special thanks also go out to Mary Eva Candon, class of 72. She has been a tremendous resource for the Speaker Selection Committee in her efforts to assist us with political speakers. Her diligence and creativity have been positively amazing. Thank you, Mary Eva. In a book entitled The Seven Prayers of Pope Francis, whom our former speaker, I enjoyed very much listening to Sister Simone call him Frank. <laughs> <laughs> the author, Philippa Albi, tells us about a prayer that the then very newly elected Pope asked of young people on April 24th, 2013. In the Pope's words, which I quote, I ask the many young people to be generous with their God-given talents for the good of others, the church, and our world. <coughs> Ms. Albi calls this the fourth prayer, making a difference by giving ourselves. This we celebrate today in welcoming Reverend Liz Walker to, as our guest. Um, Reverend Elizabeth Walker is known to many of us as Liz, as the first African-American woman to co-anchor a newscast in Boston. Liz Walker spent 20 years co-anchoring the evening news at WBZ-TV Boston. Our guest began her broadcast career in 1974 in her hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas. After working in Denver, Colorado, in San Francisco, California, she joined the staff at WBZ in 1980. 
During the next two decades, she was very busy and she managed, among other things, to win two Emmy Awards. In 2005, she began hosting and executive producing the community affairs show Sunday with Liz Walker on WBZ. Also in 2005, she received a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School. Then, in 2014, after several years serving on the ministerial staff, the ordained minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church was officially installed as pastor of Roxbury Presbyterian Church. So as long as it looks. <laughs> Two more minutes. My husband timed me with a watch. I said, Ben, I am not running a race. You don't have to say one, two, three, go. He did. Forty years. And I worked in the probate and family court. So I'd come home, he'd say, you want dinner? I'm like, what do you want for dinner? I'm like, Ben, I, I couldn't possibly decide another thing. <laughs> I'll cook whatever you want. Anyway, excuse me for that. <laughs> An award winning television journalist, documentary film producer, and entrepreneur, Reverend Liz Walker is a humanitarian currently working in the war torn country of Sudan. Her work to save the children of Sudan by developing, along with Reverend Dr. Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, My Sister's Keeper, a Boston-based humanitarian group advocating for a girls' school in South Sudan, today educates nearly 1,000 girls in the region. Reverend Walker is the founder and principal of the Walker Group LC, communication specialist focused on nonprofit capacity building and corporate public engagement. As the producer and host of the Better Living Health Series on WCBB TV, she has had the opportunity to not only report on world problems, but as a humanitarian, independent film producer, and motivational speaker, she participates in solving them. With her strong passion and commitment to human rights, Liz Walker has, has supported dozens of organizations and causes that have made the world more humane. This description was used in introducing our guest upon what I understand is her most recent award, on March 25th, 2015, Reverend Walker was awarded the Eleanor Roosevelt Following in Her Footsteps Award. <coughs> the award celebrates <coughs> and honors those individuals whose work, whose work continues Eleanor Roosevelt's work for the causes she held dear. Human rights, equality for all, preserving the environment, peace, and social justice. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to Reverend Walker. Good job, thank you. I have to say that all of what you uh, introduced me with, which was beautiful, all of that has changed since I became a preacher. <laughs> Who knew that church was going to be 24-7? And so the work that we've done in Sudan, I haven't been there in a while, so I just want to kind of update that. I'm now the uh, uh, pastor of the Roxbury Presbyterian Church. Uh, this church is in the midst of one of the most challenging neighborhoods in the city. And uh, all that I thought I had learned, I had to relearn uh, to be a preacher in an urban area where people are very needy and there are many challenges. So I'm delighted to be here. I literally came, I literally came off the pulpit because one of the things I don't know how to do, it seems, is organize my life. <laughs> so I forgot 
and I had this event, and I forgot the time, excuse me, and I literally ran off the pulpit. I did a, a sermon. I hope that God showed up in that sermon, because I was just thinking, I've got to be out of here, I've got to be out of here, and then I literally ran and got here, so I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon for such a, a prestigious uh, honor to be a part of this Dorothy Day lecture series. I am uh, she's one of the great uh, sheroes of the world in social justice. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. There you go. New word. New word. So I am honored to be a part of this. I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my life. Some of you may remember me on TV. It was back in the day. I do all these speaking engagements and I talk to young people they have no idea who I was or what, who I am or whatever. And I always joke and say, that was back when you only had three channels. <laughs> back in the day when you actually had to get up and go change those bad boys. So it's a whole different world. But I thought I'd change my, uh, my topic just a little bit. It's called Weaned on Justice, Surprised by Grace. Weaned on Justice, because I really did want to tie it into my work in social justice. I think that I look back over my life and I, I'm, I was weaned on justice. That's how I came into the world. I, um, but in the midst of all of this work on justice, I have been humbled and surprised by the inequitable distribution of grace in the world. I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, as the judge told you, during the 50s, back at a time when um, the, the whole world was changing on civil rights. And I literally lived about probably six blocks from Little Rock Central High School. So we were in the midst of that. You couldn't be not a part of the struggle in those days, in that time, in that city. So I watched the troops roll into Little Rock. I have actual memories of the troops rolling into Little Rock. And I was a little girl. I couldn't have been more than maybe the first grade or the second grade when that was happening. I remember our, at night during that time, our parents made my brother and me sleep on the floor because there, there was so much tension in the community that they were literally kids were going around throwing Molotov cocktails in people's windows. It was a real tense and troubling time in the city of Little Rock, a city that considered itself a very grace-filled city where people got along, a city that was not supposed to be in the midst of, of hatred and, and, and that kind of a disturbance, but that's what happened in the 50s when the troops were called in to take nine black children into a Little Rock Central High School. Later on, the city that I love turned into a war zone around desegregation. Uh, and so we were raised to be a part of the struggle. If you were in school back in those days, you were a part of the struggle. I was a, a little girl when my father took me to hear Dr. Martin Luther King preach at the Arch Street Baptist Church in Little Rock. And again, I don't remember all the details, but I remember that it was electric in this, this church. Dr. King was just coming off the heels of the uh, successful Montgomery bus boycott. Again, this was back in the 50s. And he was just beginning to start this civil rights movement. So he was going to churches all over the country. Now, I grew up in the church. Uh, my father was a minister. And uh, you know we were preacher's kids. I hated church. I hated church. My earliest reflections of church were, oh my God, I will never do this when I'm in charge. I will never come back to this. Because you had to sit there, and it was quiet, and you had to sit on the front row. And there were times, and I remember the time when my dad stopped a sermon to tell my brother to behave. <laughs> You think you don't want to hear from God. That's a God experience, because my brother just stopped talking. I don't think he talked for like three or four years. <laughs> so this idea of church was not a place where anything happened except for sitting really still and just being behaving yourself. But Martin Luther King came to the Arch Street Baptist Church, and suddenly the church came alive. Suddenly he called out people to be a part of great change in the world. And I watched my mother's beautician, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Jones, and, and the, the, the man who was a busboy at one of the hotels, and the man who had a shoeshine parlor, and people who were just ordinary people were called to do something extraordinary for social change. And that was the time when it seemed to me that, oh, I get this church thing. Because we're called to live our faith out in the world. So church, social change, all of that became a part of my life. I got into television really as a part of change. We were among the first African-American women 
to be hired, the people who were hired in the 70s. I went from Little Rock, I was the first black, well, no, the second black uh, uh, woman on television in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Dolores Handy, who is still a recorder here in Boston area, was the first black woman, and I was the second. So it was always about struggle, it was always about change, it was always about equity, and, and television was the answer. And I stayed in television in Little Rock. I went from Little Rock to Denver, Colorado, as has been said, and then to San Francisco, and then I came to Boston. And again, social justice was a part of the coverage that I considered I was doing. But what was also happening to me is you get caught up in the magic of television. Television is not about social justice. I don't care what they tell you. <laughs> television is about making money. And in the midst of that, the messages that are sent out are not quite as equitable as you might think. They would do anything if they could, and it's still the case, except for now, I think, because of social media and because of all kinds of different changes in television, it may be more equitable than it, than it used to be. But I was back at a time when I started in television thinking that this would actually change things. And then what happened is you start making money, you start getting invitations to all the fancy places, and you, I believe, become as much a part of the problem as you are a part of the solution, because you're kind of caught up in the, in the, in the, the whatever, the, the marketability of television. You know how you watch Fox News? Well, <laughs> those of you who watch it, and some of you watch it, you just don't want to tell it, if you watch it for about an hour, and then you turn off the TV. You know how you just want to slap somebody? <laughs> Television sells this kind of conflict and confrontation. I dare say it's not just Fox News, and I know I, I'm, I'm a big critic of Fox News, and I go places and I have to be really careful, but what we sell on television is this confrontation. There's a good, good guy and a bad guy. There's that duality. There's either black or white. You win or you lose. But the message that you send there it's not one of justice, it's one of somebody's gotta win, somebody's gotta lose. And I was a part of that. And I, I, think, I, did, I think I did some good stories, and I think there's some great reporters now. But I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the overall message, the overall, the overall climate of media. Because there has to be a winner, and there has to be a loser. So it was in that kind of, of, of atmosphere that I lived my life. And, and justice, not so sure. I remember when I first came to Boston, they would only send us to stories. Now, this was in 1980, but Boston was still reeling from busing back then. And they would only send black reporters to stories in black neighborhoods. This was at WBZ. And not because of any kind of, uh, the reason they did this, they said, was because of our safety. That the, situ the situation was so intense in some communities that we had to be very careful. So I remember one, you know, a situation where there was a story in Charlestown and I couldn't go to that story. This was back in 1980. I couldn't go to that story, so then the assignment editor sent me to a story in Roxbury, and I got kicked out of that story because I was a reporter. So they didn't like me because I was black in Charlestown. They didn't like me because I was a reporter in Roxbury. And you felt like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? But that's what television does. It puts that kind of confrontational atmosphere over everything. But I stayed in it, and I loved it, and it was exciting. And then in 2001, I went on a story to South Sudan. Now, I was invited to go on this story by a group of human rights activists and humanitarians and preachers who were going to South Sudan to investigate allegations of slavery. This was around the time when my life was sort of changing. I was, I was feeling like, I, I, television news, I was kind of, Maybe I should do something else, but I couldn't really define it. I, I, I just was unhappy with what I was doing. And everybody in my family was telling me, you can't be unhappy with what you're doing. You make too much money. <laughs> you wouldn't dare walk away from a job. My brother said, have you lost your mind? You don't walk away from a six-figure job because you don't feel good. <laughs> Take a pill. <laughs> Keep working. Keep working. But I was also talking to some amazing people, and this is how I define grace. Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, who I don't know if you know her, but if you ever hear about her speaking someplace, I suggest you go. She is a, a Methodist minister, 
She is a pediatrician, she is a community activist, and she is another one of my sheroes in the world. And her husband, Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond, he was a surgeon, he is a minister, but they founded a church in uh, Roxville, actually Jamaica Plain, and I went with my family to that church. And they were also helping me kind of determine what was going on in my life. Well, as God would have it, they were in this group that had been invited to go to South Sudan to investigate allegations of slavery. So I, it was a perfect news story. I went to my news director and said, would you send a crew? Sudan, there's a, they're, they're saying it's genocide there. And my news director said, that's an international story. We're a local television station. We don't cover those kinds of stories. This was 2000, 2001, excuse me. So I did my own thing this time. This time life was different. I decided, you know what? This sounds like such an interesting story that I'm going to use my own money, I'm going to buy my own camera, and I'm going to go because I think this is a great story. I could get an award for this story. This is a story that nobody's told. And so this time I go on my own without a camera crew with these human rights activists, humanitarians, to Sudan. But what we discovered there, I think, was, was God calling me at that time. Because what we discovered there, I had no idea what I was getting into. Sudan, as you know, South Sudan is the world's newest country. But back in then, there was only one country, Sudan. It was the north and the south. And it had been involved in a civil war for more than two decades. Millions had been killed. Millions had been displaced. It was hell on earth. And I didn't know this going in. I just knew a little bit about it. But I was focused on these people from Boston. So when we got there, we actually go into the bush with a group from Geneva, Switzerland. We're now like on a safari. I mean, it's now now like Indiana Jones, except for there's it ain't funny, and there's no laugh track, and there's no it's there's no music, and we're on the adventure of my life. There is a war going on. We're in sub-Saharan Africa with people we hope can get us through. We went from village to village. And I, I couldn't believe that I was there, but I was with the most heroic people in the world. And so we talked to people, we went and, and, and um, interviewed people, they told us about life in a war zone, they told us about how their villages had been burned, how their men had been killed, how their women had been enslaved and taken up north. The stories were so horrendous that your, your intellect, you couldn't even grasp this, this couldn't be for real, but this is what they were telling us. That first year in 2001, we stayed on the ground for about two weeks. And, and you would talk to a woman who had been gang raped by 10 soldiers who had come into her village. And she's telling you in this very kind of disconnected way about these uh, rapes. And she's speaking through an interpreter. And you talk to a child who, who's been hacked up by, with machetes by the enemy. And you're just hearing brutal stories of inhumanity to man. And, you're, and the people you're with from this country are there to fight for justice. But for me, it was how in the heck, that's not what I said, but I know this is a religious group, and I'm trying to be a preacher really hard, how in the heck can we do anything to change this situation? This is intractable. These wars have been going on. These people hate each other. It was the North against the South. It was Arab against Christian. It was uh, uh, Muslim against Christian, Arab against African. Just every kind of conflict that you could imagine. And nobody had been able to stop it. And it seemed that nobody really cared about it. I hadn't even heard anything about this in the news. But in the midst of this mayhem, we talked to people who were somehow living in the midst of death, who were somehow still offering hospitality in the midst of war, who were somehow uh, existing with a resilience that I had never even, I never even knew existed until I went to Sudan. And so we were changed by the people we met. Through interpreters, we just kept talking and listening and people were telling us that yes, there's a war going on and yes, I've lost all my family, but I still live. And so this group of Americans from Boston and Geneva, Switzerland and other places were asking the people in Sudan, what could we do? And they said, well, you can tell your president to help us end this war. You can uh, try to get food for our families. And you can help us educate our children. 
Gloria White Hammond decided this was the job we'd take on, that a little group of uh, people from Boston, Massachusetts, would try to build a school in South Sudan. That's 21 hours, 9,000 miles away. But she saw the need for justice for people who had no education on the other side of the world. And I was just transformed by that. I couldn't believe that somebody could stand up and say, absolutely, we can do something. And absolutely, we have the responsibility to do something. Except for somewhere in the back of my head, I remember that that's what Martin Luther King said to people in Little Rock, Arkansas, back in the 50s. That yes, this seems like an intractable problem. Yes, it seems like something we can't change, but we have a responsibility to do something. And so that's what social change was all about. That we would take on this job of trying to work with these people in this village in South Sudan, build a school because they asked us to help. But here's the grace part. How can you just keep living in a place where hope, there just doesn't seem to be any hope? The first time, week we were there, I was shooting my camera, I was shooting pictures, trying to tell the story of these Bostonians in Sudan. And uh, this woman was at a tukul, which is a tent, or a hut, I'm sorry, a hut is how the people there, mud and thatched up, you know, like straw, they build these uh, tukuls. She's outside her tukul, and she's pounding in a giant mortar and pestle kind of thing. She's uh, grinding up maize, making it into a flour so that she can prepare food for her family. In this part of the world, in Sudan, and in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and all over. They, their food is the biggest issue, resources. They have very little food there. So she's going to make uh, either corn uh, pudding or perhaps some kind of porridge or maybe bread. But she's pounding the grain. They pound grain for four hours to take care of one day's meal. This is the truth. So she's got this thing. It, it's, it's just something to see. And I'm trying to get the, just the right picture of this woman doing this. So I get up closer to it. I don't notice there's a bowl of uh, her flour that she's already created with the pounding. And I got really close, and I accidentally kicked over the bowl. And in that instant, I mean, I wasn't trying. In that instant, I destroyed her whole day's meal just with my own carelessness. And so we both kind of jumped down. She, she went down, and she was actually trying to scoop it up for a second. And it's dirt, so there's no way. There's no store to go to. There's no more flour. I've ruined everything. And it just hit me how, 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 oh, how easy it is to, to mess up somebody's life when you don't even know. And how the balance between things going right and things going awry are just like that. I couldn't stay with this woman. I left her there. I said, I'm sorry. I ran, caught the rest of the tour, but it stayed with me and plagued me the rest of the day. She, I guess, got some more corn and kept on pounding. The end of that day, we were supposed to get to another village, the village of Akan, where we ended up building our relationship. And the trucks never came to, to pick us up in the village. And so we ended up having to walk, and it was late afternoon. But the only way to get to the next village was to walk. And it was probably about six miles away. But this is sub-Saharan Africa. And so walking six miles is like doing the Boston Marathon. I mean, it's hot. And there's not you know, any place to stop. And you just have to keep trudging. Well, it turns out that some women from the villages volunteered to carry our luggage to get us to the next village six miles away. And they put all our stuff on their heads and we start this trudging to the next village. And I looked closely, and the woman whose food I had destroyed was among them. And you know, I'm not trying to paint some romantic picture, I'm just telling you what happened. She wasn't being paid, she didn't know me, this was not about, oh, that's Liz Walker on TV. But there was something about her spirit which was just hospitable. She just was doing it because we needed help. And so they did. They carried our luggage. They carried our supplies. They carried our food to the next village. Well, that's my definition 
of grace. That's hospitality. That's not being so caught up in your own world that you can't share in someone else's world. And that one happened over and over again in South Sudan. And these people don't have any, well, things have changed now. I'm sure that, that they probably had outside communications. Perhaps they even had cell phones in some of these villages. But at the time, there, were no, there was no outside communication. There was no electricity. The, this was being in the bush. You had to take everything in with you. They didn't know who we were. They, it, you know, they saw Westerners through the missionaries and through the World Food Program that dropped food into their villages and into their areas. But there was a hospitality that went back generation and generation. And when you think about it, in the Middle East and in Africa, hospitality, that's, that's sacred. That's in the, if you go in the Bible, that's, you know, that's, it goes all the way back to the, to the beginning that you are, sh you are supposed to show hospitality because you don't know who's going to show up at your door. But who practices it? They do. That's grace. So after this first trip, we go back to Sudan for 11 years. Gloria's founded an organization called My Sister's Keeper. And the point of this organization was to support the women and children in South Sudan. Whatever they needed, we were going to try to help them do. And we ended up, through this village of Akan, in the bush in South Sudan, building a school. And the first day of school, uh, it took us years to build the school. It took us years to raise the money. It was in an area that had no resources, so we had to go all over Sudan to try to get resources. We ended up going into Uganda. And, and finding people to help us, and coming back to New England, and speaking like I'm speaking today, and telling you that we need to help these children in Sudan. And, and, and telling you what I've learned is that the world is so small. Women are not educated in this part of the world. In Sudan right now, South Sudan and Sudan, fewer than 1% of women receive any education. Now in Su Sudan, which is the Muslim country now, it's, it's run by a pretty, pretty extreme set of Islam. Uh, some women are educated, but in South Sudan, because it's so poor, very few people are educated. Very few women are educated. So the idea of build, building a school for girls was revolutionary, but the people there wanted us to do it. And so Gloria and I trudged back and forth. She founded an organization. We had now probably 12 women helping us. We were raising money all over the country. In 2004, Darfur breaks out, and there is a genocide. We had called what we saw in South Sudan a genocide, but now the whole world hears about Sudan through what happened in Darfur. And so more people help us, and our school is opened in 2007. And it was the most extraordinary opening of my life. A very small building with corrugated tin roofs and open doors, uh, built for about 300, eight classrooms, and the first day of school, as has been said today, a thousand girls showed up. People walked for hours. Girls came from other villages, other compounds, other places, because they heard education was happening. They're not even sure what education is, but they know it will change their lives. When you ask mothers, and this is like, a, I'm making a long story very short, but we did, uh, all kinds of assessments. We would go back and ask the community what they wanted. We talked to other experts. We, it wasn't just popping up a school. So it, we had to learn before we could actually do it. But when we uh, asked mothers in this village why you want to be educated, because the issue is we're going to build a school from K to 8. We're going to try to find teachers, which means we have to go to other countries because nobody in this part of the world is educated. So we're going to have to do a lot of things. Why do you want to be educated? And one of the mothers told us, and I'll never forget this, she said, if I can read, then I know the signs that will tell me if the water is safe for my children to drink. So education there is a very different thing than what we think of education, but it is a sense of freedom. That whole experience changed my life because we, we, we tend to think in this country that our poor are poor, but you haven't seen poverty until you go to the other places in the world. I work now with young African American children, mainly, but work with young urban children from all races, really. 
And they're always asking me, well, why would you even go to Sudan? We have problems here. We have no problems here compared to the problems out in the world. Yet there is something different about the spirit. I just can't put my hands on it. The only thing I can think of is grace. That there is this, uh, it's not even definable really, but there is this notion of relationship that's critical, that's important. You hear about tribes fighting each other. And, and what do we know about Africa? The only thing I know about Africa is what I saw on TV. And because I grew up in the 50s, it was black and white TV. Johnny Weismuller was Tarzan. Remember this? You may be a little young for this. And every Saturday, this is all I know about Africa, Johnny Weismuller would be chased every Saturday as Tarzan by about 500 Africans. They were so mad at Johnny Weismuller. Took me years to realize they were mad because why would a man from England be king of the jungle? Does that make any sense? But whatever. They were fighting. They were mad. They would chase Johnny Weismuller as Tarzan all through the jungle. Every Saturday morning, Johnny Weismuller as Tarzan, just in the nick of time, would grab a vine, swing across a cliff, and be saved. And every Saturday morning, 500 Africans, without fail, would go off the cliff. Y'all don't see these scenes, but these are the scenes I grew up on. So if you ask me, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I say, well, I don't know if I can be Tarzan, but I don't want to be an African because there's no future in that. <laughs> so you go to Africa, you go to the continent, you go into these countries, and you're expecting savages. You're expecting people who have no idea. But when you get deeper into getting to know people, and building relationships with people, that's when you discover God's grace. And the grace was this, this ability, this resilience, this dignity, this, this absolutely faithfulness to life. That despite what's going on around me, I'm gonna keep on living. And I'm gonna be as good to you as I can. Now those are not the leaders, the people who are fighting these wars. Those are the people who are living in the midst of the man. So this, this school that we built for them was really an education for us. Because we'd go back and little children would be our friends and, and we would see people with nothing trying to make it and we were changed. I would come back to Boston where we have everything but something's missing and I would just be depressed. And they, they say that happens to you when you work in developing nations. Grace. The roots of grace, of course, are biblical. And we talk about grace as a religious word. But author Philip Yancey calls grace the world's last best word. And that's because no matter in what context, it always means the same thing. Gratuity. You, you give a gratuity to someone who served you in a restaurant. It's a little extra something because their service was so good or a grace period. Banks give you a little something extra. They used to. Do they still give you a grace period? <laughs> a little extra time to, to pay your debts. Or you say someone is gracious, and perhaps he or she is, is elegant or very giving in the way they handle the world. So that grace, that accommodation, that little something extra is how I define it. And this is where I define it. Doesn't matter if it's Sudan or right here on the, on the river way. I live on the Jamaica way. And to cross the Jamaica way and Jamaica Plain, it's a beautiful roadway. It's a winding roadway that you know, connects the western part of the city to downtown. And to go down that roadway is just a lot of, it's just really pretty. It passes uh, conservation land. And there's uh, mansions and there's triple deckers and there's all kind of people. But the problem with the Jamaica Way, if you've ever been on it, and it connects, is that it probably outlived its usefulness back in 1899. <laughs> because around 9 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, just like the Riverway, it just becomes a parking lot. And I live right on the corner of one of those streets where there's not a light. So if I'm going to get into traffic, I'm on the mercy of the people on the Jamaica Way. Now, I don't know if you ever drive the Jamaica Way, but next time you ride it, notice this. I'm here trying to cross the street. There's no light. The only way I'm going to get into traffic is for you to let me in. 
But do you let me in? No. This, I don't understand this. I can watch this every day. I now watch it. You don't let me in. You're not going anywhere. Because the traffic's not moving fast. I have talked to engineers. That's how serious I am about this. I've talked to Boston City engineers. It's called a, a courtesy gap. When you slow your car down and let somebody in. It happens maybe one out of every seven. It started to improve, I think, because I'm preaching about this. But <laughs> when I first started talking about it, it was like one in every 10 people would actually make a courtesy gap. For the life of me, I don't understand how, if you're only going 10 miles per hour, there's no place you're going to get, all you have to do is slow down just a bit and let that person in. And people don't do it. We are on our cell phones. We are talking with the other person in the car. If women are putting on makeup, all kinds of times what I see, but nobody lets anybody in. So here's my definition of grace. Giving somebody a break, just making a courtesy gap. Could be forgiveness, might be space on the highway, might be forgiving me for messing up your, your food. It's just giving the world a break. And my argument is that we need grace as much as we need justice. We need grace more than we need justice. I have been watching, as you may have been watching, this situation in uh, Baltimore, Ferguson, New York, all these places where black men are being killed. And the question is whether it's fair. And it seems to be not fair at all. And what I've seen, there was an article in the paper about Baltimore, the latest case in Baltimore where a man has had a broken neck death while in police custody. This case is traced back to they didn't put him in a seatbelt in the police van, and he gets jostled around. And they think that's what happened. I'm, I'm speaking because they, they have not said officially what did happen, but they think that's what happened. But this whole idea of being jostled around is traced to a zero tolerance policy that the man's name is Martin Malley. He may or may not be a Democratic candidate for president, but during his tenure as governor of Maryland, he had a zero tolerance policy. That means that no matter what you're doing, if it's just off just a bit, you're going to be arrested. Now, as a pastor in Roxbury Presbyterian Church, when I first came to that church, that's what I wanted, zero tolerance. We have people drinking on the street. I have drug deals on the porch of my church. Zero tolerance. But since I have stayed there for a little longer, there's got to be some grace in there. You can't arrest everybody. You can't throw everybody into jail. Because the tension that's created is what's happening right now. There is a war going on between young men in the streets and police. It's in my neighborhood, it's in Baltimore, it's in New York. People are saying, no justice, no peace. I would argue we need grace in there. Give people a break, just a little space. There are about 10 to 12 men who hang out on the fence across from my church, and they drink all day long. And when I first got to this church, the thing that just really aggravated me, these are drunk let me just say inebriated, alcohol involved, because I've got to use politically correct words. Alcohol involved men, first of all, they want to flirt. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> I'm walking the street trying to get to church. Hey, darling. Hey, darling. Reverend darling, please. <laughs> My point is, I was so angry. Why are these people out here? It's taken me years. I've been here for three years. It's taken me three years to realize it's not just that simple. There's no jobs in my neighborhood. People have lost hope in my neighborhood. When you lose hope, you, you're in pain in my neighborhood. When you're in pain, you try to block the pain. Take a pill, have a drink. And so you see that kind of hopelessness. Then the police come, because Reverend Liz said, Haul them all off to jail. Zero tolerance. Put them in a van. Don't put them in seat belts. And somebody dies. Or they get killed. We've got to have some grace. 
Zero tolerance doesn't work. I'm sorry. I'm in the midst of it. We have got to give people a little space. What we are doing now at Roxbury Presbyterian Church is we've started a, a center for trauma conversations, and we are opening up our church, the basement of our church, every Thursday, once a month. We only have money for once a month now. And we are letting people come, as they will, whoever you are. Doesn't matter if you're drunk, doesn't matter if what's happened, and we want you to talk about your pain. And there's no rules. You can just come in, just like AA. We have hired, we've gotten a little funding from Partners Healthcare, uh, Robert Kraft, uh, the uh, Fireman family have been wonderful and they've given us seed money. We've hired some clinicians to come in on these Thursday nights. We hope that eventually this will grow. But the point is, we've created a little space, just a safe space. We're not doing church in here. There's no offerings in here. Just come in, tell us your story. We're going to be a community around you and then leave. Maybe you'll come in next week. If you've got a serious problem, we have people who might be able to help you. If you just want somebody to hear you, we're here. We're gonna create a courtesy gap for you because we believe this world doesn't have enough justice, but it doesn't have enough grace. And so people come and the stories are horrible and the stories are painful, but we believe there is healing in that. Justice, absolutely. The equitable and fair distribution of resources we absolutely need. But we've got to have some grace. We've got to teach our children how to forgive. We've got to teach them how to show compassion. We've got to teach them that they're worthy and valued. We can't have them living in an environment where hopelessness rules. And that's what I learned in South Sudan. That's what they do just because they're human. You belong. You belong to this tribe of people. You belong to this community. And we care about you no matter what. And we don't have to have anything, but we give you everything we have. We will share with you. You have worth and value. Somewhere along the line, we have heard the word that it's either us or them. And everybody on the streets in Roxbury, on the Jamaica Way, we all live our lives. If I win, you lose. Somebody's got to show some grace. I'm just saying. Somebody's got to show some grace. So here I am, this social justice advocate, and now I'm trying to teach about forgiveness. I'm trying to teach about letting go. I'm trying to let go. I'm trying not to hold on to my own pain from growing up in a desegregated South where people threw Molotov cocktails through your windows or spit on you because you're black. I'm trying to let go of my own pain from a, a marriage that failed. I'm trying to teach my son that he has to show grace. And I want to show grace on the Jamaica way. Because I think it all matters. I think it all counts. It's how you create the atmosphere of resilience and success in society. My last story, and gosh, I've talked too long. Is it almost, I've been looking at a clock that hasn't moved since I started. <laughs> About halfway through our journey, uh, back and forth to Sudan, Gloria and I, and Gloria Whitehead is just one of the most amazing women in the world. We uh, lose our luggage. We have to travel to South Sudan to talk to the people in this community, and I, we lost the luggage. We don't know where we lost it, between Boston, Chicago, Nairobi. Uh, I say Chicago, she says Nairobi, who knows? <laughs> but we get off the plane in Nairobi, about to get a charter plane into the bush in South Sudan, a four hour charter ride. And there's no, there's no tents, there's no water, there's no food, everything. Because everything you take in, you have everything you need, you have to take in. And so the decision has to be made. We're gonna stay on in Sudan in the village of Akan for about four days. The decision has to be made whether we are to just let it go 
go back or keep going. And Gloria, of course, is always, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. So we decide to you know, get into Nairobi, go to a, one of those big markets and get what we can. So we got t-shirts and I think we found some pants and stuff. And maybe we got water. You have to have water in this part of the world. But basically we had nothing. Somehow the people in the village of Akan found out about this. They satellite phone or one of the guides told them. But by the time we landed in Akan, they realized, they knew that we had lost our luggage. And if anybody has heard me speak, this is where I always end because this is the one thing that happened to me that I will never forget, ever, 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 ever. So we get off the charter plane with our little bag of what we had. The people from the village come out to meet us. If I ever write the book, the book is made into a movie, this will be the closing scene. <laughs> work with me, work with me. We get off the plane. The people come to this to plane to meet us because we've built relationships. They love us, they know us, we love them, we know them. Chola is there, Sarah's there, all of our friends. The old women bring pots of goat and okra because they heard we lost everything. The men have, have constructed these two hand-hewn um, uh, cots where we will sleep. And I don't know how they did that because there's so few resources. Uh, deforestation, there's no wood in this village. But they brought this out for us to sleep on. Uh, the children bring us sticks because there's, there's some tree or something that can clean your teeth there in, the, in uh, Africa or at least in this part of northern eastern Africa. And the young women bring us wraps to wear, these brightly colored wraps. And it dawned on me that we had gone to save Africa. And Africa saved us. You see, what you give out comes back. If revenge is the way we're going to run the world, and it seems to be in foreign policy, seems to be in Congress, seems to be on the streets of Roxbury, that's what you're gonna get back. But if you give grace out, if you give this, this, this courtesy space, if you give people a break, you'll get a break. This is my philosophy of life. Thank you for having me this afternoon. There was just this revelation leads to this revelation, and then that affirmation. But uh, it was somewhere, probably on the ground in Sudan, and it was somewhere talking. You know, the first one of the first interviews I did there, I interviewed all these women who had talked about gay rape and all the things they'd been through, and I got all the way back to Boston and realized I did not get one name. What was that about? I was so scared, so intimidated, or whatever I was, but I didn't get it. So it was probably that, you know, just a little, I think God gives you just a little bit. Because, can I say God here? You can say God here, right? I do these speeches all these places, and I'm thinking, is this a corporation? Because then I have to say the universe, or, or is this crowd have to say your highest self, right? You know, God, <laughs> so nice I can say God, I forget. I know I'm at Emmanuel, but I just want to make sure. But I think God gives you just a little bit. Because if he gave you all the stuff, you wouldn't be able to take it. Because I, I, who knew I was going to end up on Warren Street trying to get drug abusers off my porch, I mean, of the church. So I think there was no one revelation, just one, two, three. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me one tangible thing that a sex worker has done for you that you wouldn't want to help with your talking about? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question seriously. Oh, I think you are. Now, there's lots of things I think I can do, but... I, my philosophy about practicing grace 
is actually, I work really hard at not cursing people out on the highway. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you my truth. Yeah. I, and, and trying to give somebody a courtesy gap. Yeah. That's why I put that story in there. Because I think it's that simple. I, one of the things I do on Warren Street now is I speak to everybody I see. People don't speak to people. You say good morning, this guy's getting ready to stab me. I'm like, wait, wait, maybe I'm just saying good morning, good morning. I mean, it's trying to, it's just trying to show what, that you're human and I can connect with you. That's what I learned in Sudan. So I don't think it's big things necessarily. I think we forget that there are the little things that matter. I really do. It sounds so hokey, but I'm telling you, I think it, it makes a difference. Anybody else? Yes. Can you talk about what was the hardest part of the hardest part of? The hardest part of my conversion? The hardest part was giving up the money at Channel 4. <laughs> Teresa, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. And I do not, you know, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. The hardest part is giving up that life. And every once in a while I'm going, what am I doing here, you know? But uh, the gifts have been so much greater than what I've given up. The, you know, and I, I laugh. It's, I make a joke. It's not really that serious. I, you know, the hardest part is really, I just try to be faithful to to what I believe is truth, and sometimes that's very hard for me, and to do that consistently, and to do that when nobody's watching. And our work over in that neighborhood, which is probably not even two miles from here, it might as well be Sudan. And I don't mean that as a cultural put down, I just mean some of the problems are so, uh, so embedded that you wonder how we're gonna make a difference in people's lives but it all matters, and you just do the best you can. And you do the best where you stand. Like the woman said from Plymouth, you, you are planting hope wherever you stand, uh, knowing that that matters. So that's my answer there. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Were you able to get teachers to the school? That, <laughs> teachers in the school was the hardest part. We had uh, volunteer parents who themselves had very little education, uh, but we uh, were working on that. The government was supposed to take over. We were supposed to build the school, and then the government of South Sudan was to take over. That's been very erratic, because they've been very much involved in conflicts and that kind of thing. What we decided, I read a book, Emma's War, which is about Sudan. It's a book that was, it's a really good book. Uh, but it was, it's just about the history of the wars in Sudan. And one woman is telling another woman, she's saying, this is just too big, I'll never do anything. She says, you just do what you can. So we did what we could. There were some teachers, some left, didn't come back. The school's still standing. I'm not sure how many girls go there now. We did what we could. And we pray that God will fill it, you know, fill it in. That's all you can do. So I don't have good news to report to you the situation. I don't know how, the, the situation is very bad now in South Sudan, that uh, Gloria, who has been going back since I went back, I've not been back since I took over the church in Roxbury, but Gloria went back, I think two years ago, you couldn't get in. So there's lots of uh, tribal conflicts and all kinds of inner things going in this part of the, the country, so we haven't been in. But we did what we could. And you have to kind of live with that. Anybody else? Well, this has been wonderful for me.
help us continue to have these wonderful events um, because there is something about grace that's really contagious and we, we appreciate having as many of you as possible give us that kind of support. We appreciate your presence here today. The, um, we also would ask that if you would like to, please join us across the uh, wall, take a right, go into the administrative, administration building, into the Fenway room, and we have um, all kinds of um, refreshments, and you'll be able to, if you have another question for our um, most honored guest, you'd be able to um, see her for a few minutes if you'd like. But again, and we hope to see you, each and every one of you, and bring a friend next year and when we do this again in April of 2016. Thank you so very much.